Bem-vindos ao Type Theory for All Podcast. This is your host, Pedro Abreu, and in this episode, we interview Jasper Cox, one of the core developers of Agda. We talk about the philosophy behind Agda, his work on pattern matching, the uniqueness of identity proofs, or UIP for short, and why it is inconsistent with homotopy type theory. We also talk a little bit about his other projects on rewrite theory, Agda Core, and a tactic library for Agda. So without further ado, let's get into it. How about we start talking a little bit about, about your history? Um, how did you get involved into doing to improve it and um, contributing and working with dependent types in general? Right, so I got started with this, I think during my master's. So I did a master's in mathematics and Well, I was already interested uh, quite a bit in uh, computer science, especially theoretical part. Um, but at that point, I was really mostly curious in like, like uh, foundations of mathematics and different uh, logical systems. And I taking a course on this, uh, yeah, uh, on this. Uh, but I was really like unsatisfied with the standard set theory. Yeah, and. Uh, This uh, this looked extremely ugly while I was really looking for some. I mean, this is the fundamentals of how everything is supposed to work. If this isn't elegant, then why, yeah, why are we doing this? And then, um, and then I had to choose a uh, topic for my master thesis. And so one of the proposals that was there was by uh, Dominique de Vrieze. So and he was. I think the only person at that time in uh, in Leuven who was working on Agda, and uh, so this was a proposal. And from that, reading that, I, I learned about type theory, which is this alternative foundation to, uh, yeah, to mathematics and but also to uh, computer science. Which, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, so I decided to pick that as my uh, master thesis topic. Um, I ended up not really doing exactly the proposed topic, but uh, I just I started using this or starting learning a lot, first of all, about type theory. So I read um, Simon Thompson's book, uh, Type Theory and Functional Programming, which is freely available. And I would definitely recommend that, even though it's a bit dated somewhat uh, sometimes, but uh, it was a very good uh, way to learn about uh, type theory in the beginning. And then I started playing with Agda, and this was was great because well, uh, I already knew Haskell from about two years uh, back then, and uh, yeah, this uh, combined this uh, elegance of type theory with the, the nice uh, functional programming that I knew from from Haskell. Right. Um, yeah. So and that's how I kind of got into Agda. And then very soon, actually, after I started using Agda, I started being frustrated that, well, things weren't quite working as well as I wanted to, right? And in particular, so with this uh, pattern matching, that well, is, is a very nice and elegant way of writing definitions by just specifying equalities in Agda. Um, and this, this works very well. However, you could write down equalities, but then these equalities do not actually or Agda didn't always understand these equalities, right? So you write, it really, it depends on, on which order you write these equalities. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of details of the internals that you need to understand. And so that was the goal of my uh, master thesis was to try to make it, well, more declarative in a sense, right? So make this uh, more intuitive uh, to use. And I think most of the work that I've done since then has been from similar motivations, right? So something in Agda, well, is quite nice. It's, it's, it's really cool to use, but then it doesn't quite work as expected, or you really need a lot of knowledge about the implementation to use it effectively. And I'm trying to improve that. Yeah. So that's when you started your PhD? Yes, so indeed. So after doing the master thesis, um, so first uh, my supervisors, so, uh, so Dominique de Vrieze and Frank Piesens, they asked me, well, maybe you want to write a paper about this uh, topic that you did a master thesis on. Um, and so I got a contract for like a month, but then also actually they asked, well, maybe 
you want to continue working on this thing? And uh, I said, well, yeah, that uh, sounds uh, very nice. I enjoy doing this. So, and I had a lot of other ideas. So, yeah. Um, so we ended uh, submitting a proposal to the FWO. So there was uh, the Dutch uh, or the sorry the Flemish Research Council, uh, and they found or they have this uh, quite competitive program for uh, PhD grants, and I ended up getting uh, that for uh, for four years. Yeah. So um, yeah, and then uh, indeed, so I I continued so. One thing that was very new at that time was this uh, homotopy type theory, right? So the, the book had just been released uh, last year and I was, I was reading this or understanding parts of it, uh, not understanding uh, many other parts of it, right? It's, uh, it's a very, well, mixed bag has a negative connotation, but yeah, there is a lot of uh, uh, sp uh, spikes in the difficulty curve, I would say, yeah. Um, but then, yeah, and I had worked on this uh, pattern matching before, and uh, yeah, so there were some problems there, right? So you couldn't really use this uh, pattern matching in combination with uh, homotopy type theory, and like that. Or there were some attempts at at making this work together, right? This was this, uh, without K flag, but um, yeah, this this had a lot of bugs in it, or it was there were a lot of corner cases where it wasn't working. So then. I really started diving into that uh, theory even more and trying to figure out where is this incompatibility actually coming from, right? And that led to then the, yeah, the paper uh, on this uh, pattern matching without K and much of the other work as well that I did during my PhD. So you did, yeah, you went to Gothenburg to, to do that, is that right? Um, no, so I did my PhD in Leuven. Uh, with uh, so with the same supervisors as my master thesis, right? I was there for four years, and then so during that uh, PhD, I started to go to the Agda meetings. So Agda meetings are uh, well twice a year. Usually we have a meeting of one week, um, and yeah, usually at some place in Europe. Uh, we also had one in uh, in Japan, but. Uh, uh, and yeah, so basically all the people working on Agda or using Agda come uh, together in one place and we just have uh, a few presentations, but most of the week is actually just spent on hacking on the Agda internals or developing new libraries or discussing uh, the future of Agda. Uh -huh. and, and, and who are the people involved in, in, that, in those meetings? Right. Uh, so, well, of course, the, the people from Gothenburg, uh, this is how I met them first, right, uh, at these meetings, right? So um, Ulf Norrell, who's the original implementer of well, the current version of Agda, uh, then Andreas Abel, uh, Niels Anders Danielsson. Um, but then I also ended up meeting a lot of other people there um, who were working back then on, uh, on Agda or in Agda. Um, yeah, so I think uh, I have a large part of like uh, the people I know or my academic network actually come from going to these Agda meetings. And then after I finished my PhD also, uh, yeah, this allowed me to get a postdoc position in uh, Chalmers with Andreas. Yeah, that's how I ended up there. So yeah, I think, yeah, that was these meetings. They are always very productive and uh, very uh, good to... Yeah, to get to know people working on this. And, yeah. So how, how was it at the beginning? Like, okay, so you had this this core idea that you wanted to improve pattern matching in Agda. What were the first steps that you had to take in order to make it happen? You know, like how, in order to actually open the code and start understanding, okay, I have to fix this and that. And how was that process? Right. So at the beginning, definitely that was quite intimidating, right? Because the code base of Agda is not small it's not quite as large as uh, let's say ghc or uh yeah but something like that but it's still a, a lot of code and it's all written in in haskell uh, and there is definitely parts of it that are uh, very uh, hard to understand and like the whole structure also is just uh, very overwhelming when you first get into it so my strategy for making changes to it, right? In the beginning definitely was, 
well, very narrowly focusing on one detail, right? So in this case of this implementing the without K option, uh, I figured out from reading papers and such about pattern matching that the, the crucial part here is the unification algorithm, right? So I, I really focused on that module of Agda and tried to make the minimal changes necessary to make uh, my IDs work. And yeah, so definitely in the beginning, I tried to, like, even if I saw, oh, this is strange or that is strange, I tried to not change too much to it uh, because I was afraid of breaking things. <laughs> I think uh, that ch kind of changed later, right? I, I got more familiar with more parts of the code base. And uh, yeah, and I started also not just making these small, very targeted changes, but also doing bigger refactorings. Um, but uh, yeah, for that, you need to know it a bit. I think it's also important to know that, well, so it's a big code base, but each part has kind of, I think, one person who knows that part best. So if there's a bug in that, then usually that person will uh, look at it and uh, try to solve it. Right. So there are some parts that I have uh, little idea about how it works. The, the, the parser is one example. I, uh, I always get stuck when I have to change something in the concrete syntax of Agdad. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just uh, a lot of work, I think, to do it. But uh, the, yeah, the type checker and especially the pattern matching, that's now uh, very familiar. It seems, it seems to me that the community is very open for receiving contribution. Um, similar to like an open source language. Yeah, it is. It is an open source project. So in the beginning, we were using uh, Darks actually. So when I just joined, uh, but then I think after a year or two, we moved to uh, GitHub. And so the main reason for that was to make it easier for people to contribute and uh, make pull requests and comment on issues. Uh, so indeed, we we're we're very. Uh, eager always to welcome new people. So it doesn't help that often, uh, or it doesn't happen that often that uh, new people join, but uh, maybe because it's a bit intimidating, right? Um, but yeah, I, I'm always uh, very glad when I can help people to uh, to get familiar with it. Yeah. How, um, what's, what's the internal structure for who are the people that make the decisions of where do you want to see like, the growing towards or what are the changes that are acceptable and what's not? How, how's the internal structure for the development of the language? Right. I think it's quite open, right? So if there's a small change or some, some bug fix that needs to be approved, then typically getting approval from one of the developers is fine, right? And it will be merged. And if anyone else disagrees, maybe it will be reverted later, but that doesn't happen that often, uh, right? And then for bigger changes or like new features and such, usually these are discussed at the Agda meetings, uh, right? And then uh, we try to come to a decision together on uh, whether this is something we actually want or part of the direction we want Agda to go in or not. There's not one person who has to approve uh, things or who has like a, a clear idea of, okay, this is where um, Agda should go. It's maybe more of an organic process. Let's see where things go and work from there. That's really not, yeah, I, I have this feeling that Agda is very research, a, a very researchy language, right? Like where we can, researchers can test their ideas and yes, push forward. Yes, I think forward. that's that's correct, yeah. So I think that's a part of, or important part of the philosophy of Agda is that it's, it's kind of a playground for doing new experiments with uh, having features in, in type theory, right? And, and we see that a lot in the last years, right? We saw the, the cubicle act is maybe the most prominent example, but we have like size types. We have uh, lots of things with uh, reflection. Well, we have the, the rewrite rules that I implemented, also the prop universe. It's important that the whole system is open and uh, it's it's easy to make changes and try out new things, right? And I think if you compare it to that's to Coq, which I think main competitor, then uh, that's maybe one of the biggest differences actually. Yeah. That uh, if you want to change something in Coq, well, okay, you have to change the kernel, and that is very conservative or. This is it's quite difficult to com to convince people to change something in the kernel. Yeah, they they have they have some really big hackers that work a lot on it, and it's 
It's, I think it's older, right? Yeah, Cockpit it's part. definitely, yeah, it's older. So there's a lot more history behind it as well. Yeah. Uh, well, in Agda, I think, yeah, if you want to implement a new feature and like, it's a reasonable feature and it's hit, I mean, you, it, you can turn it off with a flag or you can, then this will probably be accepted. Right. <laughs> right like the language extensions. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, these things that you that you're that you're talking about, um, contributing and and doing some research. I see that, for example, correct me if I'm mistaken, but it seems to me that even your work, that pattern matching without K and all these new ideas that you came up with to further improve pattern matching in, in Agda, even the Cock developers build a plugin for that um, with similar ideas with equations. Right, so I think the equations plugin already existed before I started doing the work, uh, but also it didn't have this uh, without K option. Um, and then so there was uh, a new version of the uh, of the equations plugin later that uses uh, some of my ideas as well. Um, and then in a sense, the equation plugin that's solving a harder problem than what we're doing in Agda because they are actually desugaring to eliminators, right? So Cog doesn't have uh, pattern matching in the core language, so they have to do the translation uh, in practice to, to eliminators. Um, and that's uh, something that, well, Agda actually does have a notion of pattern matching or case trees, at least in the core language, right? So that's um, a bit easier to support this in, uh, in Agda in general. That's right. So um, let's let's get a little bit more technical. Then um, you're 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 saying a lot that the main idea of what you have implemented is to do pattern matching without K. So what what is K? Right. So K is I think the easiest way to explain it is it's an alternative or equivalent formulation of the uniqueness of identity proofs. Right. So this uh, uniqueness of identity proofs that's a a principle that says, well, we have this uh, equality type, right, uh, which uh, proves that two things are equal. Uh, but it says that, well, we can only ever have one proof that two things are equal. Right? There might be no proofs, but there can be at most one proof. And all these uh, other proofs are equal. And yeah, I think for, for much of the early years of type theory, this kind of was uh, assumed to be true, right? Why would there be more than one proof of an equality? There's no reason for there to be. Um, but then, uh, yeah, I think starting, well, some early work in the 90s, but definitely in the late 2000s, um, people started realizing or realized that, well, there's actually models of type theory which do not uh, satisfy this rule. And we can do interesting things with it, right? Uh, yeah. So, and that's how this, uh, yeah, the whole homotopy type theory uh, started. So how does this affect pattern matching? Why do you need that for pattern matching? It seems like quite disconnected in some sense. Well, yes. Yeah, so why do you need it for pattern matching? Um, because, okay, so you don't need it for pattern matching as long as you're just doing pattern matching on simple types, right? So if you have types like you have in, in Haskell, um, just with, with parameters and, and constructors, then there's no need for equality types. There's no need for this uh, KX. Um, so the, the, the real need for this only comes in when you go to index data types, which, uh, well, I guess they're very similar to GADTs in uh, Haskell, right? Um, like uh, I mean, you have uh, vectors or you have, um, like you can have well-typed or well-scoped uh, syntax as an uh, index type, or also the identity type itself is defined as an index data type in Agda. Right. Um, and so if you want to do pattern matching on those uh, index data types, then you have to well, solve some unification problems in order to type check this definition. And in particular, we have to, yeah. So when you pattern match on a variable uh, of some data type applied to some indices, you have to unify these indices with the indices of each of the constructors. And so if the unifications uh, fails, then you know, well, there doesn't have to be a case for that constructor. 
So that, that constructor is not uh, possible here. Uh, if it succeeds, well, you, you get a substitution and that substitution is then applied to the, to the re return type, to the type that you wanted to get. Um, so in both cases, it's very important to have this unification algorithm uh, in order to type check definitions by dependent pattern match. I hope, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to summarize this. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I hope it's uh, possible to follow. But... No, yeah, it, it did make a lot of sense and, and it's, 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 it's clear. Yeah, I think, I think I can put a link on, on your papers on the description and also your thesis. Yeah, maybe that's a, that's then, a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So I go a lot yeah, in my uh, PhD thesis, maybe is the most accessible. Uh, and then, so yeah, where does this uh, K axiom come in? Right. So, um, well, it turns out that well, we have this unification, uh, but now in order to, um, to, well, to translate this definition by dependent pattern matching to the standard things that we have, in, which is just the eliminators in, of, the, of the data types, we have to justify each of these uh, unification rules somehow. Right? Each of the rules that are used during unification, we have to justify. Um, and they will end up as some kind of term in the, uh, as part of the translation uh, to eliminators. Yeah, so, and it turns out that one, one of the very often used uh, rules of unification, which is the deletion rule, right? So this rule just says that if you have an equation that says x equals x, well, then we can, we can solve that equation, get rid of it. Well, it turns out that in order to justify this rule, you need the k axiom. So you need this uniqueness of identity proofs. And I think intuitively, uh, yeah, you can make some sense of this actually. Uh, because well, you have an equation between x and x, but if there's multiple different ways of proving that x equals x, or multiple different ways of identifying x with itself, right? Then it's not valid to just throw away this equality. So, so, and then yeah, so that was the the problem I identified with this uh, unification algorithm that it really well, it depends crucially on this uh, deletion rule, which requires k, but in a lot of cases, actually, you don't need this deletion rule, right? So you can just turn it off in the unification algorithm and then say, okay, we'll try to do unification uh, or using the other rules, right? Like injectivity and the solution rule when we have a variable equals some other term. Yeah, so quite often this still works. And then you have a perfectly valid translation of pattern matching to eliminators. That, that works even uh, if you don't have this K-rule. And that's uh, what I did. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, thanks. So um, if I remember correctly, then you were saying that this, this axiom is uh, incompatible with, with some other models, and in particular, homotopy type theory, right? If yes. you assume that, then you get some sort of inconsistency. Can, can you talk a little more about that? Right. Yes. So, well, the first time this was noticed that this is, I mean, there's actually models of um, of type theory where this doesn't hold was this uh, groupoid model by um, uh, Hoffman and Streicher from the 90s. And so they constructed a, a model of type theory in which this, you, you do actually have different uh, proofs, right? So they interpret each type as a groupoid. And then the morphisms in this groupoid are equality proofs, and you can have several different ones. Um, so, but they they showed mainly well. Okay, we we do have models where this is not true, but they haven't really shown like why is this useful. And that came later when uh, so, uh, the late uh, Vladimir Vovotsky, um he introduced this uh, univalence axiom. So this is a different axiom one can assume. So instead of the K axiom, that uh, says that, well, anytime we have two types that are equivalent, so we have functions between them, that if we compose them, then uh, you get identity function, right? Uh, anytime you have two times that are types that are equivalent, then they're also equal according to the identity type. And moreover, it's a bit stronger than that. Actually, it says that the type of equivalences is itself equivalent to the type of identity proofs. 
And so that is a very different way of looking at, well, at equality proofs between types, basically. And so there is a, there's a good justification for doing this, which is basically what it's saying is, well, anytime you have two types that are equivalent, right? They're equivalent, so they, they should morally be the same type. So and, and by converting this equivalence into an identity proof, we can actually replace one type by another. And that's something mathematicians quite often do in practice, right? They write a proof for, for one type and then or by analogy or by uh, yeah, uh, this, this, this other type has the same structure. So the same proof goes through and uh, this works fine. So this, this uh, univalence axiom is turned out to be quite uh, useful for doing mathematics and type theory. And, but yeah, so crucially, it's saying that, well, for every equivalence we have between two types, uh, there is an equality proof. This, this means that, well, if there's two different ways of uh, making an equivalence, so for example, there's two ways of building an equivalence between the type of Booleans and itself, right? So you can either keep the elements or you can swap them. Yeah, so there's two equivalences, so that means there's two equality proofs. So that means that this K axiom is not true anymore. For this reason, there you cannot have both of them at the same time. Wow. Yeah, that was a really good explanation. Thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, om omotop type theory is definitely well with the with the pardon of the of the word, but it's definitely hot in our field right now. It's it's very interesting. I think I think the things that you were that you were saying about um being a grad student and looking on homotopy type theory and not understanding yeah. much. <laughs> I think you described 85 or 90% of grad students that get interested in the topic and like, oh, yes, there is I really... think uh, that's uh, probably the case. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think so. My advice would maybe be try not to understand everything at once, right? It's, it's much better when you're getting started, really like. Okay, try take one detail that interests you and, and zoom on in on that and try to improve that or try to do something with that and really understand that to the de to the depths right of it. Maybe try to implement it or try to change something to the implementation. And in the course of doing that, you will get a lot of understanding that will make it easier later to learn other things. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, that... Uh, or at least that helped me to uh, get uh, <laughs> That's great advice. Get... We had we had a, a group here in my university that we were trying to follow the I think Benjamin Spears book. It's a great book. Yeah. But um if I started feeling like if you don't have an expert that knows on it, it's very hard for you to go on yourself because like it says in all math, right? Like you're kind of like in the in a dark room and if you have someone that knows a little bit more it, can really get you unstuck very fast and things go a lot that's, easier. That's also true. So I did have a lot of benefits from talking to uh, Dominique, my supervisor. Yeah, that was quite important and that he already knew a lot of this stuff. And then later also at, uh, at Agda meetings and my colleagues in Chalmers. So you are, you are saying uh, you've, you've done a lot of work in, in, in pattern matching, independent pattern matching. And I saw that you started having some publications working with rewrite theory. Um, where does that come along? What's the, what, what is rewrite theory and how does that interesting for the stuff that we do in programming languages and, and Agda and all of that? Yeah. So this actually goes back to the earliest work I did during my master's thesis, right? This frustration that, well, you can write down some equalities in, in Agda, uh, but then, yeah, it seems like Agda instantly forgets them or they're not, they're not holding as definitional equalities, right? The type checker doesn't know that they hold. And yeah, at, and, and, and especially um, this, this is quite... Um, painful if you want to do some experiments with, well, with any kind of extension to type theory or any kind of variant of type theory in Agda, right? It's, it's very annoying. Well, you can postulate uh, some new constructs, but then they don't compute as you would want to. Right? They don't have the right computation rules. And so this was the original motivation for me to look into this uh, rewrite systems, right? So basically what 
BI tools uh, do is they just allow you to specify that anytime you see a term that looks like this, I want to reduce it to uh, to this other term, right? And um, yeah, and ideally, well, the type checker will pick up on these rewrite tools and apply them uh, systematically whenever it uh, sees something that matches. And so by, by adding these uh, rewrite tools to type theory, it suddenly becomes a lot more extensible. So both in the sense that, well, for, for existing definitions, right, that you, can, you can make them compute in more interesting ways, even if they're kind of stuck. So that the classic example is if you have defined a plus on natural numbers in uh, Agda, Right, it will compute when you give a constructor on one side, but not when you give a constructor on the other side, right? And that, I mean, you can you can add a rewrite tool so to make sure that it also computes when you give a constructor on the other side. So that was kind of uh, one part that, or one problem that these rewrite tools solve. And then the other problem is this: well, the more experimental uh, things that you want to do in Agda, right? So people who want to use Agda not necessarily as its own theory, but as a, as a vehicle for experimenting with different theories, right? That have more interesting computation rules. And, and yeah, for that, it also works very well, right? So you can postulate all the constructs that you want and then postulate uh, rewrite rules. And then suddenly you have a, a whole type checker for your own type theory with, uh, with these computation rules. It's, it seems to me, though, that it's kind of easy to introduce some sort of inconsistencies by adding these rewrite rules, seems similar to axioms, no way? Yes. Yeah, so, well, in a sense, they are, they are worse than axioms, right? So by postulating some axioms, you're kind of threatening the consistency of your theory if you postulate something false. Uh, with rewrite rules, you're not so much threatening the consistency, but you are instead threatening some maybe, I would say, even more fundamental properties of your type theory, in particular threatening to break subject reduction. So you might have a term that has one type and then you evaluate it and suddenly it doesn't have that type anymore. And, and the cu curious thing is that this happens even, even when all your rewrite rules are type preserving. Right? So even when you have only type preserving rewrite rules, you can still break this subject reduction. And uh, yeah, so we have a paper actually on this, uh, so if you want to know the details, uh, but uh, very briefly you can, well, so there is a crucial property uh, that's, that's kind of, uh, I mean, or a crucial lemma in the proof of subject reduction, which is the injectivity of pi types. So which says that when, when you have two function types that are equal, then also their domains have to be equal and their codomains have to be equal. It, it turns out that by having rewrite rules, you can break this property. And, and so this breaks the whole proof and actually breaks uh, subject reduction as well. So what, what we did in the paper is, well, we actually identified uh, what do you need to hold in order to, uh, to not break subject reduction, right? And um, I mean, there's a few technical details, but the main property you need to hold is that your rewrite rules need to be confluent. Right? So you, you need to always get the, the same result no matter what, in which order you apply the rewrite rules. So it's not enough for to always apply the same consistent strategy for like applying them in a certain order. You really need them to be confluent no matter what strategy you use. Yeah, and then, so I also implemented a confluence checker for... Uh, for Agda. So it's still a bit experimental. I don't know if many people have used it, but uh, so in theory, so you can turn on, uh, when you're using rewriting, I would actually recommend doing that, right? So not just turning on dash dash rewriting, but also turning on uh, dash dash confluence check, which will then uh, warn you when it's uh, not confluent. So this confluence checker, it tries to come up with a proof that is is confluent, or is well, more it's like... more of a syntactic check. So it's not uh, it's not constructing a proof so much as directly checking. So it's maybe similar to how the termination check works in Agda. Right? It doesn't produce a proof of termination, but it just directly says, well, this is terminating, or this might not be terminating. 
I have uh, I, I haven't used in Agda that much, like just very little. But um, can you can you use different arguments for proving termination, for example? Uh, yes. So the uh, well, the termination checker I would say is quite powerful. So I don't know the precise theory uh, behind it. So maybe then you need to invite Andreas uh, <laughs> if you want to. But it's um, based on this, I think. Uh, almost full relations. Um, yeah. There's this paper called uh, Stop When You're Almost Full that kind of describes <laughs> how, it's, uh, uh, how it works. But yeah, it can deal with a lot of things like, um, I mean, uh, lexicographical orderings on arg arguments. Um, and uh, like, Or if you have mutual recursion, you can have one step where it gets bigger, but then two smaller in the next step. That also uh, Right, works. right. It's pretty smart. Um, but it, it's still a uh, syntactic check. So it still means that, yeah, it's not a uh, modeler or a modeler way of checking termination, right? It still depends a lot on the exact syntax what you used. And so there's also another termination checker which uh, relies on the size types instead, hmm. which is a more uh, semantic way of uh, checking termination. Uh, and that. Well, I, I would say it's still an interesting experiment, but at the moment there's uh, there's some problems in the implementation, uh, both with the solving of size arguments, but also with the consistency. So yeah, I unfortunately I'm not sure if I can recommend using it at the moment. But right. I would I would really like for someone to step in and uh, give a good implementation or fix the implementation. Yeah. There is no one working on that right now. Uh, no. Uh, there it is, well, the perfect PhD thesis right there yeah. then. Yes. Perfect idea. So, <laughs> indeed. Uh, I, I would say so as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. I also saw that there is an exper experimental linear types in Agda. Did you play with that? With, there's no linear types as far as I know. Uh, there is this uh, erasure annotations, right? So you can yeah, annotate yeah, yeah. things with quantity zero. Mm -hmm. But isn't that like the first step for linear types? Yeah, it's kind of, so it's uh, a part of this quantitative type theory. Mm -hmm. right? So this uh, was introduced by uh, Conor McBride first in this paper. I, I got plenty of nothing. And then, uh, yeah, and it was uh, later other people also um, introduced this well, more formally, maybe. Yeah. Or, uh, so, and indeed, so there you both have uh, the one quantity, which is linear types, but also the zero quantity, which is basically runtime erasure. And that allows you to well, annotate in the type of a function which arguments are only there for type checking but are not used at runtime. And so that was something that previously already the compiler of Agda tried to infer that automatically, right? So it tried to infer, okay, this argument is not used, so we can erase it during compilation. Uh, but there was no way of making sure that a specific argument got erased as for the for you as the Agda developer or the Agda programmer, right? Um, and so these erasure annotations, they I think they solve a real problem, right? They allow you to be sure that uh, a certain argument is not there at runtime. Allow you to do a lot of fancy dependently typed stuff in your programs, but without having to compromise on the, the guarantees that in the end, this will just be simple code that uh, runs as expected. What other? Um, so yeah, we, we we talked about size types and and syntactic arguments for decreasing of your of your of your function, and also um, what's 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 the name you gave? A quantitative type theory is yeah. in the like starting to be implemented. What are other kind of research features that are being worked in in Agda? Do you know any other? Well, I would say the coolest or the biggest project that uh, people have worked on recently is the Cubicle Agda. Uh, so I haven't worked much on that myself, but uh, Andrea Visozzi implemented uh, most of that. And that's really a um, implementation of this whole uh, homotopy type theory stuff. Um, so in, in the early years, or when I started working on this homotopy type theory uh, with uh, without K option, well, we didn't really know yet, or no one really had an idea yet, how do we actually build a type theory in which this 
uh, univalence is not just an axiom, but something we can actually use and compute with. Uh, and then a lot of very smart people uh, spend a lot of time on trying to come up with a type theory that does this, and this ended up being this uh, cubicle type theory. And so cubicle Agda is a well, version of Agda that uh, implements this cubicle type theory. And so in this, you can actually, well, this univalence axiom is no longer an axiom, but you can actually prove it and compute with it. Um, and, and you also have this, well, other thing I haven't talked about yet, but you have these um, higher inductive types so that allow you to uh, have uh, data types which have uh, equality constructors, right? So you can do things like uh, define quotient types or define other uh, well, topological spaces as data types and do basically do topological proofs in a very synthetic way. Does that change pattern matching anyhow? Do you have uh -huh. to think a little harder on how to actually? So yes, I think there are some changes um, that need to be made uh, when you have these higher inductive types, right? So the, the univalence um, doesn't change it so much. Um, but yeah, the higher inductive types, well, basically the uh, some of the other unification rules also fail to hold for them, right? So you might no longer have injectivity of constructors or disjointness of constructors anymore. And you have these extra equalities. Right. Um, wow. And then, so there's another thing which changes kind of. So, which is that in this uh, theory of cubicle type theory, there is kind of each data type kind of implicitly has an extra constructor, um, which is used, well, it's mostly a technical detail, right? So you don't see it as the user, but it's there to make sure that you can always transport with, uh, with this uh, data type. So this uh, transport operation that, or to substitute basically with an equality always uh, computes in the right way. Um, and so in the implementation of cubicle Agda, you never have to deal with that constructor explicitly, but it kind of, it will automatically insert extra clauses, uh, in your definition to, uh, to deal with the cases for these, uh, constructors. Well, so sounds like when you're dealing with higher order inductive types, there is a whole new world that just unveils and we have to rethink of how inductive data types. Yeah, I think, I think it's very cool. And, uh. I, so on, on, on the one hand, I would like to work on that uh, more, right? I haven't worked on that very much. On the other hand, I think there's still there's still a lot of problems with uh, Agda without <laughs> cubicle stuff, right? Uh, that I would also like to solve and, uh, yeah. and that are maybe more relevant if you want to use Agda for more mundane purposes, let's say. What, what are the kinds of... What do you have in mind on the top of your head? What are the sort of problems that you've been looking at and thinking about recently? Well, so one thing is, well, this notion of, or different notions of irrelevance. Um, and, and, and well, erasure is also part of this, right? So you really, quite often when you're working with dependent types, you will get these errors that this thing is not equal to that thing, and uh, your definition is garbage, right? A type checker will tell you. Uh, and then you look at it, and you'll see clearly, well, but these, these things are equal. Why aren't you a bit smarter? Yeah, so you need to then use transport or substitution to convince the type checker that, well, this thing and that thing are really the same. Irrelevance is kind of a solution to part of this problem. So it's saying that, well, when you have this function, uh, this argument really doesn't matter, right? So no matter what argument was given here, it's always going to result in the in the same result. Right? So it's, it's it's irrelevant for the type checking, and so that often makes it uh, yeah it easier to make your definitions type check without having to do all this bureaucratic work. And so this is actually another thing that I've worked on uh, is this uh, universe uh, prop in uh, Agda. Right. So it's uh, if you compare it to the Cox sites, there is also a prop universe, but it's actually in, uh, prop in Agda is actually more similar to the strict propositions in uh, Cox S prop. 
Uh, and these are, well, this is basically a universe of proof irrelevant types. Right? So, so each for any type you have in this prop, um, all the elements are equal, right? according for the type checker. And this, um, yeah. so this allows you to work with this irrelevance in a more in a more natural way, I would say. Wait, so what's what's the difference between prop and asprop? Right, so prop is um, is a universe of propositions, also in Coq, um, but it does not have this definitional irrelevance. Uh, so that means that well, you can. You can assume that all things in a prop are equal, but the type checker doesn't know about it. Right? So you will still have to kind of make use of this assumption explicitly. While with sprop, the type checker will do this automatically for you without any. And so, unfortunately, it was not possible to make prop uh, in Coq itself uh, into uh, strict uh, or uh, prop, right? To make a definitional irrelevance. Uh, because, well, one reason is that you can actually use uh, props to prove termination of functions. And then if you if you would make this irrelevant, then you could actually make uh, functions that, well, they're still terminating when you would run them on closed terms, but they would loop forever when you apply them to, to a variable. Uh, so you would actually break um, well, strong normalization of the theory, and this would also break decidable type checking. So, yeah, and this is property. Well, they didn't want to lose this in uh, in Coq for understandable reasons, right? So this is why they had to introduce a separate uh, universe. But in Agda, we didn't have prop in the first place, so I could just uh, make the, in my opinion, the right version of prop, uh, <laughs> the main one. <laughs> Then you you like we, we we talked so many different ways to break the theory of popular language. I feel like we're building on such a brittle field, right? Like it's so easy to break subject reduction or yes, or it's, how your function actually it's terminates. Definitely still in in a sense still uh, the wild west of trying out <laughs> new features and uh, yeah, um, and uh, building like extensions. And I think that. Yeah, maybe what makes it even worse is that, well, okay, so for each of these features, I mean, we do have a paper on SPROP where we prove that this is consistent and it has decidable type checking, et cetera. So we kind of know that SPROP by itself is is a fine feature to have. Uh, but then we we do this for 10 different features and we combine all of them in, in one language, right? Uh, and and suddenly, yeah, who knows how these different features interact and uh, how, what what kind of problems they might cause when you combine them. And often that happens, right? We have, yeah, unfortunately, but there's quite a few uh, bugs in Agda that happen because of this combination of features, right? I mean, as long as you don't use these features, it's not so much a problem, but yeah, often we get... Um, we get bug reports of people saying, oh, I was using size types together with cubicle or I was using uh, prop together with, uh, I don't know, which other feature. And then suddenly things break. Right? <laughs> wow. Because probably because no one has tried that before, that's a combination <laughs> of features. No, I think that's what makes our field so, um, how can I say yeah. it? Which? right now because every two different ways you combine a language you you can reason about them and, and get a new paper but it's true it's very hard for you to actually come up with that paper because then you have to reprove all of the properties and reason very carefully what's yeah and it's on. also a problem for the implementation right because yeah, each time you want to add a new feature to the implementation right. you're kind of you're forced to look at the interaction with all these other features yeah I think, so, yeah, that, that's that's a problem for all programming languages in a way, right? But it's spe spe specifically brittle for, for theorem provers because we really need them for to be correct, yeah. right? Like a bug here is really catastrophic. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, eventually we should move on to something less experimental. And that is... Uh... That was actually part of my next question that I had for you. How do you see the future of Agda? I mean, I think that's uh, not an easy question, right? Because on the one hand, I 
I want to see, con I mean, the continuation of all these experiments. And I want to see even more weird extensions that uh, solve one problem or that uh, do something that, that's currently very frustrating to do, to solve it in a very elegant way. Right. I, I definitely want that to continue and have new people uh, contribute to it. And on the other hand, I, I feel like, yeah, there's a lot of different uh, tier improvers, dependently typed languages that people are working on. We're starting to see that there's some general lessons, right, that have been learned many times over now. Uh, how to implement basic things of these of these type theories, like uh, implicit arguments, inference, like uh, I mean, reduction and conversion checking. I mean, but also some features that like uh, how, how to do elaborate uh, like reflection, elaborate reflection. That uh, that are now in. I mean, you have that in Idris originally, but now it's also in Agda, in Lean, in uh, some form in Coq, right? And we're we're repeating a lot of the same work. And I think, yeah, at some point it would be nice to have have these different communities come together and say, oh, okay, let's now actually try to take all these lessons we've learned and build something that's really good and that can be used by, like, not just by, by us and by people writing ICFP and bubble papers, but uh, that can be used by students and by people who actually, I mean, by mathematicians who just want to formalize their theories, um, by, I mean, by just uh, programmers also, right, who want to write programs and maybe do a bit of verification on them. And, uh, and, and for that, I think, well, so I think maybe yeah, you, you probably look more at maybe a more stable system like Coq at the moment, but still that's very i think it's very hard to to learn to, or to start learning at the moment right for those people so i would i would eventually also like to see such a language be developed that uh, makes this really a lot more accessible and maybe doesn't include all of these experimental features right so i, I really want that to happen but i'm not sure if that language will be agda I, I would really want to have like people from different uh, communities working on this together. Uh, and actually, we so we had maybe a start to this, I would say, uh, with a workshop that I organized with uh, Richard Eisenberg, so the WITS the workshop on the implementation of type systems. And this was one of the goals of this workshop, right, to bring together all of these uh, people working on these different uh, fancy type systems and uh, get them to exchange ideas and maybe I mean, at some point maybe start building things together and not just work on all these uh, separate systems. Yeah, I was actually really upset that I could not join. I, I was doing some other personal things. So yeah, thanks for organizing that. Actually, how does how does it work to organize a, a workshop? Uh, who do you have to talk with and what's... Right, so... This was, well, also the first time I did this. So it was, uh, I learned a lot of new things about this. All in all, it was not that difficult, right? So what we did, well, so there was the call for workshop proposals at Popo. Um, and so we wrote a proposal uh, for the workshop, so which included like the, the general scope and the kind of the, the aim, why is there, uh, why there's a need for a new workshop. This this got accepted, so we started promoting this. So I started, I started like tweeting about this and sending mails to mailing lists um, about. Well, okay, we have this uh, new workshop, and we're like asking for one-page abstracts, uh, and if if you want to come to give a talk or lead a discussion, then oh yeah, then so part of the work was like assembling our program committee. So we asked like people who we thought were like involved with all these different systems if they wanted to join. I think that was a very good experience. I even like, uh, I mean, a good step on the, towards bringing these people together, right? It was gathering this program committee, which I was uh, really happy with that uh, so many people said yes, who uh, like, I wasn't sure whether they would uh, accept or not. Yeah. And then 
uh, I don't know, there was quite a bit of enthusiasm. So we got uh, got more submissions than I think than I expected. And uh, we got a very nice program. Oh, yeah, and then we also we, we, uh, discussed with the program committee. So who we would invite and how we would uh, for the invited talk and how we would do the schedule, how we would organize these discussion sessions. But but actually, so most of the practical details were very nicely taken care of by the people organizing. Uh, we could really focus on the on the content of the workshop and like, gathering the right people. Other than that, yeah, setting up everything uh, with also with the hybrid uh, hybrid setup was uh, done for us. So. So yeah, if if you want to do it, I would definitely say it's a lot easier to collocate with one of the big conferences. Although I well, I also have organized the Agda meeting before, so that's if you, if you have such a small meeting, then that's that's also, I think, not too much work actually, right? So you you mainly need to send out an invitation and have a room for a week with some coffee and, <laughs> and, and internet. And that's, uh, that's the main thing we need to have an Agda meeting. That's all you need. If, and if you want grad students to join, we say just get some pizza and a lot of grad students right. will come. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I saw that all the wait, um, all those presentations are, are on YouTube, so I'll leave the link. Yeah, for that so but that was also well. done by the uh, Popol uh, organization, so I'm very grateful for that. So we didn't have to do anything; they just uh, that's great. Yeah, and uh, really the good. student volunteers were really great to uh, with uh, helping us. That's awesome. Well, yeah, this this idea of bringing bringing the community together is is really good. There was there was also another another meeting the other day for like mathematicians that are using theorem provers and they they try to to who was organizing that but anyways they try to invite a lot of different um theorem provers community because they also think it's very fragmented so your your idea is more towards the implementation side and their idea is more in the usability side so right. they had a lot of people with the cock with lean with Mizar. Are you Those... talking about uh, Euro Proofnet, the cost action, or? Uh, I don't think so. It was like no. one week or two weeks ago. I I I definitely forgot the name. I'll... So the the Euro Proofnet is something else I'm involved in actually. So um, this is a European project that was uh, recently started as a with a cost uh, project. And the goal for that is really uh, bring together different uh, theorem improving communities, right? So both, both systems based on type theory, but also uh, higher order logic, first order logic, um, like automated theorem provers as well, uh, and, and and try to improve the interoperability of those, right? So say you want you have written a proof in Isabel and you want to use that in in Coq or in Agda. Uh, how do you do that? One big question that I always have when I think about that, it would be great if there would be more tools in order to to bridge this gap, right? Because I, now if I do a cook and prof, I'm kind of stuck in, prof, in, in, in cock and I have to do everything else that I want in cock. But yeah. what else? Ha what if there is this very nice library that is already implemented in Agda or Isabel? Sh there should be a way for you to easily import that or easily transport that yeah. to, to so your this code is, base. This is exactly the goal of our yeah. uh, project. But again, we come back to that to that brittle problem of how does their axioms interoperate, right? Like that sounds like a very hard problem to me. Right. And it's... that's true because yeah, you have um, like in Coq, maybe yeah, you have impredicativity, you have cumulativity. Well, in Agda, you have things like induction, 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 recursion, which are much harder to do in Coq. And you have this, I mean, in a lot of other crazy features in Agda. Um, I mean, there's no perfect solution to this, right? I think part of the solution is, well, looking at not at the all the features that you possibly could use in a language, but just looking at concrete libraries and seeing, well, Okay, which features is it actually using, right? And maybe those features are perfectly fine. So you can translate that specific library, even if the translation doesn't work in full generality. Um, and then the other thing is you could do is try to find encodings of specific features, right? So even if you don't have cumulativity in Agda, for example, you could try to insert the right uh, liftings um, 
to to encode uh, or to simulate cumulativity. Yeah, and so this is, I mean, part of what we're trying to do in this project. So the yeah, I mean, I think at the center of this project is this uh, language called Deducti, which is developed mainly in, in Paris, and that's meant uh, to be an intermediate language for the translation, right? So to make sure that if you have n proof assistance, you don't need n squared uh, translations from each one to each uh, the other one. Um, but instead, you always yeah you go to Deducti and then to the target language. So the idea is that Deducti logic is, is strong enough to yes. subsume any other logic yes. in a way. And and the way they do it is actually so Deducti is based on dependent type theory with rewrite rules. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's really cool. Okay. Yeah. So then that allows you to encode. Not everything, but it allows you to encode a lot of uh, features uh, that that you have in uh, in these languages. Huh. But it's still a very even with that power, it's still a very challenging problem. Of course, of course. Mm. Sounds like there there needs to be a lot of meta theory reasoning under the yeah. hood, or you have to accept that some things are not necessarily sound in a way, right? Yeah. Those are very interesting problems. Uh, we, so we it's, it's both a lot of meta theory, but also a lot of hard engineering work to just yeah. implement uh, translations. Uh -huh. Yeah, 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 exactly. Interesting. But well, coming back, I was talking about this workshop organized by Lorenz Center called Machine Check Mathematics, a meeting okay. for mathematical yeah. formalizers. It happened between 2 and 4th of March, organized by Sander Daman, Robert Lewis, and Asaya. Russia, Ma Bobby. Sorry okay, if I butchered any I haven't any heard names. of it yet. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was very interesting. I went there for one or two days, and it was very, very cool. But then there are still, nice. there are still quite a few people working with Mizar, which was a little surprising for me, and I learned a lot about that. So, right, that's also quite an, uh, I mean, old system, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, yeah. Uh, still going strong. Yeah. 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 And they have, Very. I know they have a huge library of like uh, formalized mathematics. Mathematics, exactly. That's why it's still very um, used in a way. Yeah. I feel like maybe it's it's similar to how COBOL are nowadays, you know, like banks use COBOL. <laughs> or banks using for uh, depending on very old formalized proofs. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there is a lot that we can learn. Um, yeah. from from talking with, with all of these different Yeah, I think indeed. So that's something I've been realizing more and more in the last uh, years, that uh, there's so much to learn from each other and that uh, so many things also that are either not written down at all mm -hmm. uh, or yeah. are written down, but in such a specific context that it's not accessible to people coming from other languages, right? I think that's that's kind of like one of the issues of having such a small community as ours and doing very hard work is that um, we don't get places like there is no real reason for us to sit down and write a nice blog post, for example, explaining, you know, like actually the, the ideas behind these hard papers that is 25 pages of implementation in Popo, you know, like that is so many Greek letters and ah, so hard to understand, but uh, I don't know. It's kind of one of the reasons I um, I like to to talk with people here in the podcast. Is like we can just go to the to the to the essence of the idea and like things that that are hard to to actually get the the details right, but it's easy to to talk and and share the ideas. So thank you very much for for joining us. Let me see if I forgot anything that we can still plug in. Um, is there anything else that we didn't we didn't talk that you would like to? No, I think I think we covered everything. Yeah, I have one last. Well, I <laughs> I I've noticed a, tr a trend that when I say that I have one last question, I usually have like three more or something. <laughs> so I'm not gonna say it's the last one, <laughs> but sure. um, Agda does not have tactics, and I saw that you came oh, up yeah. with with a little library to try to mimic that. So what's what's the idea? Um, how? Um, yeah, what's your idea there? Right, so Agda does not have tactics, that's true. Um, it does have this uh, reflection API, right? So it's based on the elaborate reflection from Idris, and that gives you access to a lot of the internals of the type checker f uh, directly from Agda. Right? And that allows you to write macros, basically, that make use of the type checker to uh, 
uh, construct some term during type checking and then plug that or splice that in into your code. Um, so that's, I mean, it's actually quite close. So you can write tactics using this uh, reflection API. The problem is that, well, okay, so this instance is use, making use of the type checker. You need to actually know a bit about how the type checker works in order to write these uh, tactics. And it's not very pleasant or convenient. So, but what, what you could do is actually write a tactics language on top of this reflection API, just as, as a kind of a library with the right combinators for writing uh, your own tactics. Uh, and that's what I tried to do with this uh, Ataka library, right? So it was basically an experiment to see, okay, how far can we push this idea of just implementing a tactics library using Agda itself as the tactics language, right? Because that's an important difference with, I think, uh, if you look at LTAC or MTAC in Coq, uh, well, th this is really a separate language that you're using. Uh, and yeah, so, well, in contrast with Ataka, that's just a library written in Agda. Uh, yeah, that you can uh, use directly. Um, so unfortunately, this uh, kind of got stranded when I got distracted by other <laughs> uh, things to work on. Um, however, I do have uh, a student, master student, who is working on, uh, on, on picking uh, up some ideas from this again and uh, trying to write uh, tactics uh, in, in Agda again using this idea. So I'm still hopeful for the future of this, but... Uh, so let me see. Let me see if I if I understand correctly. So you have you have this reflection that allows you to look at the terms yeah. during type checking. You know, like the low level terms of how things are being processed under the hood, and then and then what do you do with it? Like, um, I detect it can do changes to this term. Yeah, it can do. Basically, you have a type of of terms of syntactic terms, right? Defined in the one of the built in modules of Agda, and you can manipulate this freely, right? It's just a data type. You can generate new terms or you can take existing terms, take them apart and change some things to them. Uh, yeah. And then change the proof state that you're in. And um... uh, Well, you, you don't get to manipulate the proof state directly, right? So you have all these uh, operations that, um, I mean, type checking operations that you can call. Right. That, that manipulate the proof state. Like you can say, okay, please, can you try to unify or uh, these two terms for me? Mm -hmm. um, or can you check if this term has this type? And that manipulates the proof state indirectly. I'm thinking about, for example, let's think about a destruct tactic in Coq yeah. where you're doing case analysis, right? right? Would that be implementable? Because then, in a sense, you are changing the proof state because then now you're in, a, in, a, in many branches, right? You have to... to, to give back to the user of this tactic that, okay, you, you actually have to provide different branches as depending right. on the amount of yes. constructors that your data type has. Yes, so this is actually one one way you can use these tactics or these macros is uh, you can use them as uh, edit time uh, macros. Uh, so this is another idea that comes from Idris, is uh, edit time tactics, which is, well, basically you have a tactic, but it will, uh, you can run it while you're editing the code and it will kind of splice in the term into your source code, right? So it's more like an interactive command that you have programmed yourself. Um, and so you can also do that in, um, in Agda and then you can write a macro that basically generates a term but with some parts of it unsolved, right? And these, these unsolved parts will be the cases of your case analysis that you need. Um, or you could you could have an apply tactic that takes uh, I mean some term and then applies it to the right number of arguments and it will create new holes basically uh, for these arguments. So in a in a in a in a I don't know distant future where your master student implement let's say let's let's think about let's say he implements all the tactics that you have in in Coq and many more and then you could have a proof script very similar to how a Coq code would look like. Would that do you think that would be a possibility? Um, yeah. So, I mean, so what I did in uh, Ataka to make it work like more like a proof script is I uh, actually made this a uh, into a monad, the the API for writing tactics, right? 
And then you can use uh, do notation for writing uh, proof scripts. And because it's a monad, you can kind of implicitly pass along the, the states of the current uh, tactic, right? So basically what it will do, it will take, um, well, each, each step in the do block will take one goal as input, try to solve it and produce some sub goals. And then it passes all of these sub goals to the next step in the do block. That is really cool. Seems like Agda is so flexible and allows you to change yeah. languages in so many fundamental I mean, yes. ways. I think it, it was far from perfect, the attacker, right? So it was full of unsafe pragmas and uh, <laughs> like disabling the positivity checker because <laughs> they didn't work. Um, and also then, so in the end, so when I got some things to work, it was a bit disappointing because it was just very, very slow. So the performance of it is kind of uh, horrible. Yeah, I have some hypothesis of why it's so slow exactly, but um, yeah, so it, it, there might be some need also to improve the reflection machinery of Agda to actually be faster. That is really cool. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Hum. I also saw that you, you are thinking about some Agda core sort of stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I can talk a bit about it, yes. <laughs> uh, so, so last year or... Yeah, I started in January uh, last year, uh, started this uh, project from the Dutch uh, Research Council, so which is about Agda Core, right? So this is a three-year project for the or a vending grant. Uh, and uh, so the goal or the idea is to uh, provide a more formal specification of what exactly is Agda, right? What is the core of Agda? And uh, because that's something that well, is kind of lacking at the moment in Agda. So you could compare it uh, a bit to this uh, Metacoc project, right? Where they kind of implement all of the uh, typing rules and the judgments of the Coq language or the core language in Coq itself. And so, yeah, so similarly here, I would want to have a specification of what is this core language of Agda inside. So inside Agda itself. But then, um, okay, that got me thinking, right? Okay, it's one thing to have this specification, but then can we actually make, make use of it somehow, right? And so one thing you could do then is um, write also a, a type checker, so a verified type checker for this uh, core language inside Agda itself. And that would allow you to basically take the output of the main Agda type checker and kind of double check and make sure that it actually satisfies to these rules that are written down. So, I mean, that probably wouldn't be something very practical, but it would allow you to double check the uh, the results of the Agda type checker. So it would be super useful for figuring out bugs in the in the main type check. And, and so, and then another um, reason for doing this would be that well, if once you have this uh, specification of what what is Agda, this uh, makes it a lot easier to make it interoperable with uh, other languages, right? If you want to implement a translation to or from the Ducty, then having a clear specification of what exactly are you translating is yep. uh, really useful. And Metacoc also, well, I think since they have to, to implement kind of um, all the tree, like when you parse the, the cock, you, have, you need access to the internals and you need yeah. to specify the, the syntax tree. They give you access to that as a user, right? So you can do whatever you like. You can yeah. manipulate exactly. those things, and it's it definitely helps a lot to build tools on top of that to to translate or to reason or to do all sorts of, right. of interesting things. Yeah. Um, but it kind of kind of it's very hard for me to understand the idea behind how can you formally verify your language inside your own language. That sounds like it will break some sort of incompleteness theorem, you know. It depends, right? So there is definitely some uh, Gödel uh, statements that you you cannot prove uh, normalization of a theory inside the theory itself. You cannot prove consistency of the theory. However, I mean, Gödel does not say anything about that you cannot uh, formalize a, the, the rules of a system inside itself. In fact, that's exactly what he does in the proof, right? And that's uh, of, of incompleteness, <laughs> oh, right? You gotcha. kind of 
formalize the, the rules of your logical system inside the system itself. And there's also nothing saying that you cannot write, write a type checker. I mean, so you might not be able to prove that this uh, type checker is a total function, right? So you might have to, well, either mark it as being non-terminating, or you might have to give it some, some fuel, right? Say, okay, try for 1 million steps, and then if it doesn't work, then give up. Uh, but that's fine. I mean, that doesn't mean it's not usable. And it doesn't mean that, well, if it gives a result, then you know that it actually satisfies the rules that you've written down. So you, yes, you will not get something that's complete, that always works, but you can still get something that, that specifies the rules in a precise way and that will work in, in 99% of the cases. Or that's what I hope to get at least. So unfortunately, this, this project has been going a lot slower than I uh, hoped. And I mean, the, the reason is just that I think yeah, life as an assistant professor is very demanding, I would say. Yeah, uh, yeah. so much bureaucracy, right? <laughs> uh, and there's, right? there's yeah. so many new responsibilities, even compared to when I was doing my postdoc. Like, I mean, teaching is taking up a huge amount of time. And it's very satisfying also, right? I enjoy teaching, uh, but uh, it takes so much time. And then doing things like yeah, being on program committees, organizing this workshop, um, organizing all kinds of things is uh, is just, yeah, taking taking so much time. that it, I'm, I'm, And then doing collaborations with other people, supervising students. <laughs> is, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, it's okay. It's 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 a marathon, not a race. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. but I'm I'm still excited by this Agda core, and I still want to work. In, I'm still thinking of it uh, quite regularly, but uh, it's just hard to find the time to work, <laughs> work on it. Yeah, being a professor is is definitely a lot of work. Um, yeah, it's exciting. But um, well, I think to wrap things up, then hopefully, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, but yeah, um, this is the last one I have written over here. And okay. so to wrap up, what are your thoughts on strengths and weakness for Agda? In particular, why should someone pick Agda or not pick Agda? Right. Yeah, I, I've actually, indeed, I got this question from you in advance. So I've written down uh, a lot. Uh, so, okay, so strengths. Um, I think the interactive modes, right, the interactive commands of Agda are really one of its unique features that make it uh, very uh, nice and convenient to use. And I wish like a lot of other languages had this. Like I, always when I write Haskell code, I really want to do case split and uh, such things. So, and then also the fact that it's, um, I mean, it's one language and not like Coq, it's uh, like, which is, you have to learn the core language and then you have to learn the tactic language. And then there's like four, three or four languages you have to learn. <laughs> um, so that, the fact that it's like a unified language makes it easier to learn. Also this unified language, I think is quite a bit closer to the type theory that you see in textbooks. Mm -hmm. Probably not the same, but it's, it's much closer and will get you deeper understanding of it compared to something where you're a bit further away from the actual type theory. So I think if, if you want to learn type theory, uh, Agda is one of the best languages uh, to do that. Also, one, one maybe small advantage or strength, but that's, I think, quite important, is the uh, literate uh, LaTeX uh, mode. Right? So you can write... A paper in literate Agda code, and it will, I mean, you can run it through Agda and it will kind of uh, highlight all the codes in a very nice way. So, and then, yeah, the the code, the, it has actually been type checked, so you know for sure there's just no errors in the Agda code in your paper. Oh, wow. So a formally verified LaTeX uh, document. Yeah, well, the, the, the LaTeX is, itself is not verified. It's just the Agda <laughs> code in the paper, but yes. But uh, this is uh, something important. And then, yeah, of course, all the things that we've been talking about, like the experimental features and the fact that it's an open system that uh, everyone can contribute to is, uh, I think, one of the big strengths. Um, then for the weaknesses, I think 
a lot of the weaknesses center around the not the language itself, but uh, the whole ecosystem around it, right? So if you, um, yeah, there's just if you want to do some, like suppose I wanted to write an actual application in Agda, and then there's just still many things that are missing, or you would have to use the FFI bindings to Haskell to actually do some practical things. Um, and I think, yeah, people have been using Agda a lot more to, as a as a tier improver and not so much for practical programming. And so a lot of the libraries there are are missing. Um, also, just yeah, silly things like uh, in, I, I really wish installing Agda was like ten times easier than it is right now. Um, and uh, or and that there, there would be more people like writing introductory uh, blog posts and uh, tutorials and such on Agda. I mean, actually possible for for students and uh, new people to to read. I'm really happy that Philip Wadler wrote that book. Um, right. Yeah. Um, and and when Koche. Yeah. Um, yes. So that was uh, quite uh, helpful. Um, and there's also um, the book by uh, Aaron Stump, right? The Verified Functional Programming in Agda, which is also very good. But still, we need more of that, right? It's, uh, <laughs> true, true. We uh, always, yeah. There's still a lot of, uh, I mean, yeah, none of these really focus on on using Agda as a language, right? There's so many uh, things that are, yeah, they're, they're focused. Well, uh, Phil Wattler's book is mostly on, um, how to do programming languages in Agda, and it does introduce the basics of Agda, but never goes much beyond those. And kind of, yeah, I think the same for Aaron Stump's book. It's uh, doing some particular things and like introducing the part, but it's a very specific way of using Agda um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily correspond to how people are using Agda in practice. Well, talking about Aaron and, and using Agda in practice, I was absolutely impressed how he built a whole theorem prover Sedil using Agda. Like, oh yeah, right. That's, right? Yeah. that's uh, true. I'm also very impressed with that. <laughs> um, no, but I'm happy that, uh, I mean, always happy to see when people are using Agda in yeah, practice. Yeah, like this. yeah. His argument was, if I remember correctly, that one day, who knows, he could formally verify his, his right. implementation, right? But as I understand so far, there's not much of it that actually uses dependent types, right? So most of the, the code could have been written in, in Haskell. Oh, but then you could not reason inside Haskell about True. your code. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's you, nice. yeah, but it's not really using that potential yet. Uh, no. Or yeah. last time I talked to him. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, okay, so... I mean, weaknesses, I, I can talk further about weaknesses. So there is, a, I think the the code base, um, so it's very heterogeneous, right? But there's a lot of parts of the Agda code base that are unmaintained and just messy or, I mean, it's it's not, there's a lot of inconsistencies between different parts of the code base and like the dependency graph is an absolute hell. Uh, it's uh, so... And that makes it, I mean, and there's more and more features being added and it becomes more and more unmaintainable. So I'm seeing And this. by different people that is yeah. not necessarily exactly. communicating. And, and so I think the barrier, I mean, already now, right, for adding something new to Agda is much higher than it was when I started uh, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. eight or nine years ago. Uh, and... It's, I mean, that seems to be getting worse and I would rather want it to be getting better, right? Because, um, so, and I think, yeah, there's, there's a big need for someone really to sit down, like, uh, and, and refactor a lot of the existing codes and restructure it and maybe remove some features that were introduced five years ago and that one person used since. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, yeah, so um, performance of the type checker is a pain point. So, I mean, in, in one sense, it's often people are complaining about performance, but yeah, in one sense, it's a very difficult problem because um, when you, well, you're doing type checking for a dependently typed program, you're evaluating the program. So if the program that you wrote is not 
evaluating things efficiently, then well, time checking will also get slow, right? So in some sense, it's it can be responsibility of the user that time checking is slow. On the other hand, there is like quite a few things also in Agda that are done still in a quite naive way, or that could be optimized further. And uh, but yeah, I think that's maybe secondary to this uh, refactoring, right? So you would first need this refactoring, and then we could actually figure out okay, where are the, the slow parts, or what is actually slowing down the time check. Um, and okay, so that's that's all more maybe technical things about the ecosystem and about the development. So I think if you look at the actual type theory that Agda is implementing, um, the the most severe lag there is the lack of uh, modularity, in the sense that well, it's it's very much a problem that's shared between most uh, tier improvers uh, at the moment, right? In the sense that when you're type checking a dependently typed program, you are relying on the concrete implementation of the functions that you're of the types, right? How how they actually reduce, and so this makes it very annoying or difficult to write programs that are work in a more abstract way, that, uh, that do not depend on a particular implementation of the plus function in the standard library. Um, and and this I would say this kind of breaks uh, through abstraction barriers a lot the need to be able to reduce definitions um, and so I don't think we can get rid of it right so we need computation for type checking to be practical uh, but we could be more explicit about it right so we could be more explicit on which computation rules are we actually depending. Um, and this was one of the reasons for me as well to look into uh, rewrite rules. But uh, so far, this, I mean, so in theory, you could like, uh, you would be able to specify, OK, I want to import this definition, but only these rewrite rules of it or something, right? And, or these are the rules that I actually rely on. Um, in practice, this hasn't been realized yet. So this is still some uh, future work on the rewrite rules, but this is. Uh, and I, I'm not the only one, right? So this is, uh, if you look at uh, Andromeda, for example, uh, by Andre Bauer and others, they are very much also looking into this direction of uh, having more modularity or more abstraction in the uh, type right. theory. One thing that comes to my mind is more tooling for parametricity as well, because then you can reason about the modules and how um, the types relate to each other without necessarily looking at the implementations, right? And... Uh, right, that's indeed. So, I mean, that's a slightly different way of looking yeah. at the problem, but mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it would be interesting to look into that as well. Yeah, yeah. And we don't have, we definitely don't have enough tooling for reasoning on that on that level right. inside, inside, say, Coq right. or... I don't know much about Agda, so yeah. So yeah, indeed. So there was once a branch of Agda which introduced some internalized parametricity. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was implemented, I think, also by Andrea. This and it's used a lot of the same principles as cubicle type theory, right? Uh, but this, I mean, it was never merged into the main version. I think by now it's quite uh, outdated. Um, I remember seeing some papers of, of Bernardi with yeah. Tabel. Right. Yeah. So yes, it's based on that work, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it further evolved and then combined with some ideas from uh, cubicle type theory. Yeah. 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 And color type theory. Yes. Yeah. Type right. Theory. The type theory <laughs> color. Yeah. 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 Was... Any other weaknesses? Um, yeah. I, I mean, so the, the foundations could be, of course, uh, written down as a weakness, perhaps this fact that, I mean, there's no formally specified core language or like even a separate core language that you could type check independently like uh, most other tier improvers have. I think that's that's a weakness and that's why I'm, I mean, I want to work further on this Agda core project. But I think actually these, uh, the things I mentioned first, right, the ecosystem, like improving the installation and uh, like improving the implementation, uh, cleaning up things. I think actually these are more important than having a uh, like 
having this this core language or having this better abstraction uh, possibilities. Yeah. It's just that well, it's very difficult to find time to work on these, right? <laughs> it's uh, in, and and you're not getting credit for those as an academic. So yeah, but I think if if someone like paid me for to work on a year <laughs> for uh, uh, on these things, then I would gladly do that, right? Just <laughs> spend a year on refactoring Agda code and make everything internally beautiful and fix all the bugs. And good, and be, good usability. Great, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, yeah. I think that's a, that's a big problem for all research projects. Yes. That just and, research. and definitely as the bigger these projects get, it's the harder it gets to uh, actually properly maintain them. True, true, true. And that's like, but yeah, it's a universal problem in the, uh, community at least of uh, programming languages and i think broader like all of computer science probably has this uh, problem <laughs> in the one way or another well for, for research for sure i think maybe that's one of the reasons why cock is so prevalent and why lean is gaining so much space as well right yeah because they're actually they actually have developers working full-time on that yes. being paid by someone yeah right but well still the idea behind agda is absolutely amazing and it was a really good conversation that we had today. Thanks so much for taking your time. I'm sure that the listeners will be very happy that yeah. with all the ideas that you shared. I was um, very happy to be here and uh, share some of these insights. And, uh, yeah. So if uh, maybe a uh, final remark I uh, wanted to say is if anyone is uh, interested to work on Agda or on any of these things, right, uh, or improving the library or just curious to learn it and i'm always very happy to to chat about that uh, so you can always uh, contact me or join us on the uh, zulip uh, chat right so we have oh uh, i didn't know you guys had a zulip we a have a zulip and it's getting quite active actually so yeah dude so um definitely uh, join us there uh, there's a separate stream for developers also so if you want to learn more about the internals of Agda, then that's the place to be. And uh, once we uh, get started again with the Agda meetings, uh, be sure to like, uh, register for the mailing list, or you will also see this on Zulip, but uh, please be sure to uh, to come there. Yeah. And, uh, Make sure I'll put all of those links in the, in the description of the show. And you're also very active on Twitter, right? That's Agda true, yeah. KX. Yes, uh, I got KX <laughs> indeed. I just, I just love your handler so much. It's, it's a little joke between Cock and, and Agda, right? Yes, yes, indeed. So I had a different handle before, but I actually changed it to this because it's just perfect. It's just it's, perfect. Uh, it was perfect. I'm like, indeed. you're you're working in a different language on a on a on the wrong language. You should be working on Cock. You're, you're. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think um, uh, I don't have time to work on two languages. But, uh, <laughs> I'm always I'm, 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 I'm glad to collaborate with uh, Cog people. Yeah. Actually, that I learned a lot from uh, collaborating on this uh, SPROP and also the rewrite rules uh, with uh, people from Mount. So I would be very happy to do that again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was definitely kidding. So thank you so much for coming, and I hope you you had a good time as well. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. conversation was really cool i learned a lot if you guys also enjoyed this episode don't forget to leave us a five star on your podcast tab and follow us on twitter at tt for all our inboxes are always open for suggestions and comments we also like to take the opportunity to apologize that due to internal difficulties we lost all comments made before march at our website theoryforall.com if you notice that your comment is missing please send it again and i promise you that it will never be lost ever again. 
that being said thank you so much for staying with me this far i hope you have a great rest of your week and i'll see you next time